Hello, welcome to Philovites. In this video, we are going to talk about the Veda and the Upanishads. What are the Vedas? And what are the Upanishads? Are they two huge books tucked away in some archive? Let's find out the key concepts which comprises of the Veda and the Upanishads and how they are related or how they are different from one another. The term Veda means knowledge, that is the source of knowledge. The other name of Veda is Sruti or that which is heard. Because it is considered a revelation, intuitive insights were heard so to speak, by the sages in deep meditation. These sages are therefore known as mantra drashtas or the seers of the mantras. Veda is described as a paurushyo, which means it has not been authored by a particular human being. The other ways to refer to Veda are Agyama and Anvaya. Vedic knowledge was transmitted orally to the next generation. Many Vedic mantras have been lost. The oldest available written literature is considered to be the Rig Veda. The term Veda alludes to mantras and Brahmanas. Mantras are hymns written in honor of gods who are summoned in rituals, while Brahmanas are sections that provide directions on how to execute the rituals. Accordingly, the Veda is divided into two parts, the mantras and the brahmanas. The Samhitas are an anthology of mantras, while the brahmana sections are an elaboration and are viewed as commentary to the Samhita portions. The brahmanas, Aranyakas and Upanishads are the three divisions of the Brahmanas. The Brahmanas largely discuss about the nature of rituals, that is Yaga. And the name Brahmana also implies Yagya, which also means rituals. The Aranyakas are so titled because they deal with meditation, which is commonly practiced while living in a forest. So a forest is called Aranya. From there we get the name Aranyakya. The Upanishads disclose the absolute truth, also known as Vedanta, which gives the path to ultimate liberation. The ceremonial and contemplative elements were known as Veda, while the philosophical discoveries in the Upanishads gained their own identity. As a result, even though we refer to them as Veda and Upanishads, the Upanishads are actually a part of the Vedas itself. In this figure, you can see uh, how the Veda and the Upanishads and the Shorta Darshan uh, Indian philosophy uh, developed over a period of almost 3000 years. So the uh, in about 2000 BC uh, uh, in the Indus Valley civilization, uh, the germs of Hinduism were planted. And the Vedic period is tentatively uh, ranging from 1500 BC to 500 BC. At about 500 to 400 BC, the Upanishadic literature was replaced by the sutras, that is the oral tradition of the uh, Upan Vedic wisdom uh, was replaced by written sutras and the schools of Darshan, the Indian philosophical schools, uh, the nine schools which we have spoken about earlier, they have already started to flourish and the key uh, points of the schools were being uh, written down in the form of sutras um, or commentaries by their respective founder sages. 
and uh, by uh, 100 BC, the Charvaka, Naivashashika, Shankhujaga, uh, uh, Brahma Sutras uh, of Badarayana and the Vedanta Sutras, everything was already written down and uh, completed. After that, the next uh, development in Indian philosophy we see uh, at around 800 uh, to 1300 uh, AD during this time Adi Shankaracharya he interpreted the Vedanta Sutras um, and uh, started the Advaita Vedanta. He was followed by Ramanuja and Madhvacharya and forming thus forming different schools of the Vedanta. Again, later on in the 18th, uh, uh, 1800s, that is in the 19th century, we find the another interpretation of the uh, Vedanta by Swami Vivekananda, which is known as the Neo Vedanta, and his uh, he was uh, tutored and uh, tutored by his guru Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa. So these are the main phases of the development of Indian philosophy. So based on the figure, we can say that uh, the age of the Rig Veda Samhita developed over a period of 2500 to 1500 BC and that of the later Samhitas, Brahmanas and Upanishads developed over a period of 1500 BC to 500 BC. Now Veda is a single source but it has three forms and it is sometimes referred to as the Veda Trai. Trai means three or the three Vedas. The three Vedas are Rig, Yajur and the Samaveda. In such cases the Veda refers to creation and the three Veda represent the tripartite creation of Agni, Vayu and Aditya or uh, we can understand this, uh, this as fire, air and the sun. The Atharva alludes to the Soma or essence without which the preceding three cannot exist. According to popular belief, sage Vyasa divided the Vedic hymns or the mantra samhitas into four, namely the Rig Samhita, the Yajur Samhita, Sama Samhita and the Atharva Samhita and hence we say that there are four Vedas. For a Vedic ritual to take place, it requires four Ritviks or priests. Because there are four Vedas, there are also four categories of priests. Hota is the name of the priest uh, who uh, recites the hymns found in the Rik Samhitas. The collections of such hymns uh, invoked by the Hota is known as the Rik Veda. And this is said to have been taught by Vyasa to Pela. Adhyarvyu is the name of the priest who performs rituals as enjoined and the relevant mantras that are found in the Yajur Samhita and the collection of this is known as Yajur Veda which was taught to Vaishampayana by Vyasa. Udgata is the name of the priest of the Samaveda. He sings in high intonation and maintains the rhythm of chanting as given in Samaveda. And this is taught by Vyasa to Jaimini. Brahma is the name of the priest of the Atharva Veda who takes care of the entire proceedings of the ritual and suggests compensatory acts in case of omissions and commissions and this was taught to Sumantu by Vyasa. Thus the four Vedas uh, were propagated through these four disciples of sage Vyasa. Some selected Vedic mantras are still recited at prayers, 
religious functions and other auspicious occasions and samskaras in contemporary Hinduism. Uh, for example, we can refer to the Gayatri Mantra, the Mahamrityunjaya Mantra and the Marriage Mantras. While the mainstream Hindu tradition accepts the Vedas and their authority, there are quite a few traditions that do not accept th these. And who are they? These are the Brahma Samaj of Bengal, certain Tantric traditions, the Iyengars of South India, and of course Jainism, Buddhism and Sikhism. The Brahma Samaj does not accept the authority of the Vedas, has no faith in avatars and does not insist on belief in karma or samsara which means the process of death and rebirth. The Brahma Samaj also discards Hindu rituals and adopts some Christian practices instead. So in this figure you can see the uh, classification of Veda. It is primarily classified into two parts, the Samhita, also known as the Mantra Bhaga, which, is, uh, uh, which comprises of hymns and is addressed to gods. The other part is the Brahmanas, which is a collection of sacrificial rituals and elaborate rules. Under the Samhitas, we see the four Vedas, Rig Veda, which is the oldest and it consists of 1028 um, uh, hymns which is written in verses and Hota is the main priest over here and it is divided into mandalas that is the verses are divided into mandalas. The Samaveda consists of songs in praise of gods and Udgata is the main priest. Yaju Veda is a treatise on Vedic sacrifices. It's, it is written in prose and the main priest over here is Adhyarvyu. The Atharva Veda, it is known as the knowledge storehouse of Atharvanas, that is uh, the procedures of everyday life and it contains incantations magical spells. The main priest over here is Brahma. Uh, in the Brahmana, uh, the, uh, sorry, uh, I must remind you here that the first three, Rik, Sama and Yaju is known as the uh, Veda Tray. On the other hand, the Brahmanas are divided into Brahmanas, which is the ritualistic uh, instructions of performance of Vedic rites and the Aranyakas, that is the transition of ritualistic to philosophical thought. It is the mystical aspect, that is the Aranyakas. The Aranyakas then developed into the Upanishad, which consists of the concluding portion of the Aranyakas. It is extremely philosophical and spiritual. It is believed to contain the cream of the Vedas and it is known as the Vedanta. Now, the Aranyakas and the Upanishads uh, are together known as the Jnana Kanda of the Veda. That is the portion which relates to Jnana or knowledge. And the Rig Veda, Sama Veda, Yajur Veda, Atharva Veda and the Brahmana portion of the Brahmanas is known as the Karma Kanda, that is the uh, activities, it is the rituals, activities, it is the action oriented discussion uh, which is contained in the Vedas. So Veda basically is uh, also differentiated into the Karma Kanda and the Jnana the Vedas reflect many stages of religious philosophy, polytheism, organized polytheism, henotheism, monotheism and monism are all visible. Nature's grandeur, sublimity, beauty and utility 
are personified and deified. They are said to be supernatural and superhuman spirits, similar to human spirits. They are the deities who rule over the many natural phenomena. They are not natural occurrences. They are widespread supernatural beings who rule natural phenomena and are beneficent to their worshippers, but terrifying to their detractors. They are powerful, invincible, smart, compassionate, omniscient, all-powerful, righteous, true and benign. Hymns, prayers, oblations, offerings and sacrifices easily appease them. They bestow wealth, intelligence and moral characteristics on the earth. They bestow success in war, money, long life, sons, grandchildren and happiness. There are reference, uh, references to the gods of fire, that is Agni, the sun, Surya, the dawn, Ushas, the ground, Prithvi, the sky, Dayus, the brilliant sky and day, Mitra, the dark sky and dusk, Varuna, the rain cloud, Paryanya, the storms, Maruts, the winds, Vayu or Vata, the morning sun, Savitri, and many, many others. The many gods are personifications of various natural powers. They are occasionally worshipped separately. This stage of religious philosophy is known as anthropomorphic polytheism as opposed to naturalism. The gods have supernatural and superhuman abilities as well as spiritual traits. They preside over particular phenomena of nature, but they are not confined to them. They pervade the whole nature and beyond, or a considerable part of it, and are endowed with some qualities of the Supreme Godhead. This is the element of polytheism in the Veda. Among the many gods, anyone is considered the supreme deity for the time being when he is worshipped. This religion is known as henotheism, according to Max Müller. The notion of Rita further harmonizes the gods and prepares the path for monotheism. The physical order is represented by Rita. Rita means rule. It is a law and we'll uh, talk about Rita in detail in the next video. It regulates the natural uniformities. Rita rules over everything, including the sky, the sun, the mountains, the sacrifices and the truth. It is the natural order of things. The sacrifices must follow Rita and it is the law of ritual the law of truth, justice and righteousness. Thus, Rita is the moral law. Varuna is the custodian of this moral law or Rita. He adheres to the right and punishes sins. The gods follow the laws of henotheism. It is the uh, physical order and the moral order. It points to the existence of one supreme God whose law is unalterable and inviolable. So these are the characteristics of the moral law or the Rita. The conception of Rita prepares a way for monotheism, though it is an impersonal order which upholds the gods and the world. Hiranyagarbha or Prajapati Vishya Karma and Parama Purusha gradually take the place of one Supreme God. The Hiranyagarbha is Prajapati, the Lord of all creatures. He arose in the beginning. He established the earth and heaven. He is the sole king of the entire universe. He rules over the mountains, the seas and the rivers. He governs men and beasts. His commands are followed by other gods. He alone is God above all gods. 
he may claim the rank of one supreme god this is the element of monotheism that we find in the veda the vedic mantra purusha sukta tells us about the supreme cosmic being this sukta can be translated as follows there is a cosmic person who has thousand heads a thousand eyes and a thousand feet he pervades the entire universe and transcends it whatever exists existed and will exist is this supreme person he is the lord of immortality he is not affected by the fruits of his actions the entire universe is only one fourth of his being the remaining three fourths remain in celestial immortality the parama purusha is both transcendent and immanent he is immanent in the whole world he transcends it and remains beyond it in his immortal glory the purusha sukta teaches pantheism these are the monotheistic tendencies in the rigveda monotheism finally leads to monism one reality is conceived which is manifested in diverse ways there is one reality sages call it by various names it is said ekam sat vipra vahuda vadanti they call it agni yama matrisvan that one is not personal he is neither male nor female it is neutral it is an impersonal principle there is nothing other than it the monism of the rigveda that one was later identified with the atma or brahman in the upanishads upanishads the upanishads suggest sitting near a teacher and listening to his instructions or teachings the upanishads are a collection of intellectual works that serve as a theoretical foundation for hinduism they are also referred to as vedanta or the end of the veda they are not shruti revealed truth in the strictest sense but rather comments that describe the substance of the veda which was revealed knowledge or shruti the upanishads are generally found towards the end of the brahmanas and the aranyakas the upanishads have all been passed down orally there are about 200 known upanishads with the first dozen or so the oldest and the most important ones are referred to as primary or mukya and the uh, ancient upanishads the upanishads constitute the foundation of indian thought and have wielded enormous influence on indian thinkers and spiritual seekers and saints for example acharya shankara that is adi shankara acharya kabir ramakrishna paramhansa swami vivekananda ramana maharshi and many others however it may be noted that all these and many other thinkers have interpreted the upanishads in similar and dissimilar ways there are no definite dates uh, for the writings uh, uh, of a particular upanishad the only thing obvious is that it took a long time maybe from before the christian era to the middle ages the significance of the upanishads is generally accepted as an important component of the hindu tradition even western philosophers like plato and kant have expressed similar views emerson thoreau and schopenhauer have been impressed with them Mahatma Gandhi was uh, uh, greatly revered the Upanishads and once said about the Isha Upanishad if all the Upanishads and all other scriptures happened all of a sudden to be reduced to ashes 
and if only the first verse in the Isha Upanishad were left in the memory of the Hindus, Hinduism would live forever. And the sloka Mahatma Gandhi was referring to is this Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purmadaya Purmameva uh, uh, Vashishwate. From the absolute arises the absolute, deducting the absolute from the absolute, the absolute alone remains. Brahman and Atma are two terms that are crucial in understanding the Upanishads. The cosmic spirit is known as Brahman, while the individual self is known as the Atman. Scholars have differing perspectives on the derivation of these nouns. Brahman is most likely derived from the root Br, which means the greatest of all. Brahman is the infinite spirit source and fabric and core and destiny of all existence, both expressed and unmanifested, and the formless infinite substratum, and from whom the cosmos has developed. Brahman is the ultimate, both transcendent and immanent, absolute infinite existence, the sum total of all that has ever been is now or will be. The term Atma refers to the everlasting flawless spirit of any living being, beasts or plants and vegetation. The insight of the Upanishadic seers that Atma and Brahman are one and the same is one of the greatest contributions to global philosophy. This concept is a cornerstone of Upanishadic thinking, implying that Brahman and Atma are not different entities, but rather that the Atma or the individual self alone recognizes its own underlying truth, which is the Brahman. As a result, spirituality is also known as self-realization. Swami Vivekananda defined it as a transformation of all objectivity into subjectivity. These scriptures reveal the name of the Supreme as Om or Om, which represents the most fundamental elemental sound and the ultimate true reality of existence. Vedanta was originally a word used in the Hindu philosophy as a synonym for that part of the Vedic texts known as the Upanishads. It is also speculated that Vedanta means the purpose or goal that is the end of the Vedas. By the 8th century AD, the uh, word also uh, came to be used to describe a group of philosophical traditions concerned with the self-realization by which one understands the ultimate nature of reality that is Brahman. Vedanta can also be used as a noun to describe one who has mastered all four of the original Vedas. Vedanta is also called Uttara Mimamsha or the latter inquiry or higher inquiry. Anyone in India who believes in the Upanishads, the Gita and the Advaita is called a Vedantin. Vedanta includes the teachings of the Upanishads, the Brahma Sutras, the Bhagavad Gita and their commentaries by Shankaracharya. Vedanta is that highest spiritual knowledge after which there remains nothing further to be known. It is self-knowledge, Atma Vidya. It is the knowledge of the absolute truth or Brahma Vidya. Vedanta teaches the real or essential nature of God, the universe and the individual being or self and its oneness with God or Brahman. The quintessence of the teachings of Vedanta is that Brahman, which is 
existence, consciousness and bliss absolute is the reality and the individual self is essentially Brahman himself. To realize this oneness of the self or Jiva with the absolute conscious, consciousness that is Brahman is the goal of the Vedanta. Although different schools of Vedanta differ on the relation of the individual soul or Jiva with that of Brahman, all agree that the main aim of human life is self-realization. For want of right understanding of his real nature, man remains deluded and considers himself limited, unhappy, miserable and beset with innumerable problems. Vedanta shows the ways to eradicate these problems once and for all and enables man to attain the highest spiritual enlightenment, peace, happiness and freedom or moksha from repeated births and deaths. Knowledge of the self, Atma Vidya and knowledge of the absolute consciousness, Brahma Vidya is the highest knowledge to be obtained. It is the highest of all human pursuits. The most important four Mahavakyas from the Vedas are Pragyanam Brahma. Pragya means Chaitanya or consciousness. It is Gyan and this Pragya is not ordinary knowledge or the intellect. It is a higher realm of consciousness cosmic consciousness and that is the Swarupa of Brahma. Aham Brahma Asmi that is I Aham Brahma Asmi I am Brahman. Tat Tvam Asi you are that and I am Atma Brahma that is my Atma and Brahma are the same and the one. The world is said to originate from this reality that is Brahman, rest in it and return into it when dissolved. The reality of the many particular objects that we perceive in the universe is denied and the unity in the one reality is asserted over and over again. All is Brahman, that is Sarvam Khalvidam Brahma. The individual soul or Atma is Brahman, that is, I am Atma Brahma. Tat Tam Asi, that is, you are that, that is the one reality or Brahman. These are all ways of expressing the same truth. This Atma or Self or the Brahma is the reality, it is the Sat, the Satya which is the absolute truth. No relativity applies to it. It is infinite consciousness that is Chit. It is bliss that is Ananda. In other words, the absolute reality or Brahman is described as Satchidananda, which is Sat, that is existence, and Chit, that is consciousness and ananda or bliss absolute. In this table you can see a relative analysis of the Veda and the Upanishads. Uh, temporally the Vedas as a whole developed from 1500 BC to 500 BC. The Upanishads being actually a part of the Veda developed uh, from the 700 to 400 BC. Descriptively, the Vedas are generally ritualistic and polytheistic. The four different collections contain hymns, poems, prayers and religious instructions. Whereas the Upanishadic uh, philosophy or literature are philosophical and monistic. The major focus of the Upanishads is spiritual enlightenment. The Upanishads deal with ceremonial observance 
and a person's role in the cosmos and it is through this process that one learns the essential notions of Brahman, the supreme over the soul and the Atman whose mission is to unite with Brahman. Etymologically, the word Veda means knowledge. On the other hand, the etymological meaning of Upanishad is sitting down near, referring to the student sitting down near the teacher while receiving a spiritual instruction. Number wise, the Vedas are four in number, Rig Veda, Sama Veda, Yajur Veda and Atharva Veda. The Upanishads are many in number. It's uh, uh, more, uh, more or less 200 Upanishads and among them 18 are most uh, very important. But the most 14, uh, 14 most popular ones are Kotha Upanishad, Kena Upanishad, Isha Upanishad, Mundaka Upanishad, Prashna Upanishad, Taittariya Upanishad, Chandogya Upanishad, Brihadaranakya Upanishad, Mandukya Upanishad, Aitareya Upanishad, Kaishitaki Upanishad, Svetashvatara Upanishad and the Maitriyani Upanishad. Uh, another difference is the four Vedas are very uh, vary in their description and physical forms in their presentation. Uh, uh, for example, the Sama Veda has liturgical melodies and the Yajur Veda is a collection of worship formulas. And the Atharva Veda differs from the other three Vedas in that it focuses on magic spells that are employed on a daily basis to ward off evil spirits, danger, chants, hymns, prayers, marriages and funerals. Uh, but the Upanishads are a subcategory of the Veda and are present in the last section of the Veda, that is, it comprises of the Vedanta. So, I hope that I, I was able to uh, discuss with you the general idea of the Veda and the Upanishads. Let me know what other topics you want covered in uh, the Indian philosophy. Uh, thank you and goodbye.